we turn a page at CBS News. I'll have more to say about that later. But first, let's talk about what will always come first here, the news. There's apparently been a break tonight in that mystery over who killed the family of a Chicago federal judge. We'll start there. Also tonight, we'll cover these stories. I'm Jim Stewart in Washington. The government has arrested two alleged mafia hitmen who once served as New York City police detectives. Bill Clinton is out of surgery, but how's he doing? I'm Elizabeth Kaladin with a closer look at his post-op prognosis. I'm Vince Gonzalez at the Michael Jackson trial, where the singer may be in even more trouble than you've heard about. This is the CBS Evening News, with Bob Schieffer reporting from CBS News headquarters in New York. When the husband and mother of Chicago federal judge Joan Lefko were found shot dead last week, the police suspected a white racist who had actually threatened her in the past. But he's apparently not their man. The police now believe the real killer is dead by his own hand. Here is CBS News correspondent Cynthia Bowers. When a police officer pulled over this van on a suburban Milwaukee street last night, he had no way of knowing the driver, Bart Ross, would kill himself and thus provide the biggest break yet in the Lefko murder case. In processing the crime scene, we came upon a note written, presumably by the victim, where he implicated himself in the murders of Michael Lefko and Donna Humphrey. A note that appears to confirm Judge Joan Lefko's worst fear, that her work cost her husband and mother their lives. In the note, the 57-year-old Chicago man says Lefko's ruling against him in a medical malpractice case cost him his family, his job, and his home. Police also found bullets in his van, the same 22 caliber used in last week's murders. A separate note to a local TV station signed by a Bart Ross describes breaking into the Lefko home around dawn to kill the judge. But the plan fell apart when her husband came upon him hiding in a basement utility closet. He wrote he had no choice but shoot him and later the judge's mother. Police also say they believe Ross is the man spotted by a neighbor leaving the Lefko home the day of the killings. In his north side neighborhood, Bart Ross was known as a quiet man, but one on a definite downhill spiral. He was a man obsessed through the years, and the obsession showed itself each time increasingly. The note alone is not definitive evidence that we have our offender. Police hope to match Ross's DNA and fingerprints to evidence found at the scene. They have all along believed the killings were linked to the judge's work, but the initial focus centered on higher profile cases. Federal Judge Charles Bryant, who was once targeted as a result of his work on the bench, told us yesterday he was always most wary of individuals who represent themselves, pro se litigants. Pro se litigants very readily become paranoid courts in league with the other side. The lawyer on the other side is crooked. So those seemingly innocent cases could potentially they be among can. the most dangerous. Every one of them. Police say they haven't yet closed the book on this case, but it does appear Judge Lefko will never get the chance she so desperately wanted to look the killer in the eye and ask why. But perhaps tonight she and her family are a little closer to finding some peace of mind. Bob? Cynthia, I noticed the police chief just said that the note alone is, uh, alone is not enough evidence, but they do sound like they're pretty sure of this. Our sources tell us they feel they have the man, and that DNA and fingerprint stuff is in the lab now, and you can bet it's being expedited. Bob? Okay, thank you very much, Cynthia. An even more bizarre story tonight coming out of some arrests in Las Vegas. A one-time detective who founded an organized crime unit in New York City and another former cop have been charged with being mafia hitmen. Our Justice Department correspondent Jim Stewart's in Washington, and he has that story. Jim? Bob, even the godfather couldn't have dreamed this one up. U.S. prosecutors allege that two retired New York City police detectives who worked organized crime cases were actually paid mafia hitmen themselves who contributed to eight murders. One of the suspects had even gone on to become a Hollywood actor best known for his roles as a mobster. U.S. attorneys say Louis Eppolito, known here as the character Fat Andy in the movie Goodfellas, was arrested Wednesday in Las Vegas where he has lived since retiring. Eppolito was picked up at this Las Vegas restaurant along with his former partner Stephen Caracappa. Prosecutors say the two men did more than just murder for the mob. Caracappa and Eppolito were paid handsomely for selling out the files of the NYPD. 
Charges against the men include eight murders, two attempted murders, one murder conspiracy, obstruction of justice, and after their retirement as detectives, distributing drugs. Prosecutors allege that in 1987, Lucchesi crime family underboss Anthony Queso hired the two detectives for $4,000 a month to act as hitmen. One of the first people the detectives allegedly helped kill was this man, James Heidel, a member of a rival crime family. Mob boss Queso, now in prison, once even talked about his own role in that murder with 60 Minutes' Ed Bradley. Was just one shot to the head? I shot him a couple of times. I, I didn't. I didn't torture the kid. I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything uh, like that. I shot him a couple of times. The kid died. Queso told investigators years ago that the two detectives had been on his payroll, but the charges never went anywhere until now. It's noteworthy that Eppolito was once the 11th most decorated cop in New York history and after retirement wrote a book entitled Mafia Cop, the story of an honest cop. Bob? <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Well, President Bush is back on the road sounding an alarm again about the financial future of Social Security, and he stepped up the pressure today on Congress to find a long-term fix. If you see a problem, member of Congress, regardless of your party, you have an obligation to come to the table. You've got an obligation to sit down and come up with a permanent solution. We don't need a Band-Aid solution for Social Security. The president's on a two-day tour of four red states, states he won in November, but even in friendly territory, it's fair to say he's finding that his plan is going to be a hard sell. John Roberts is in Montgomery, Alabama tonight, and he has a report for us. Right. David Bronner knows something about retirement security. He runs Alabama's state pension, one of the most successful in the nation. His take on private accounts in Social Security? A dumb idea. Uh, basically, what you've got is uh, you're taking a program that has a problem, and you're creating your own crisis. Ironically, Bronner's a fan of private investment. Putting the state's money in everything from stocks to hotels to golf courses, he grew Alabama's pension from $500 million to more than $26 billion. Well, this is the uh, hotel that we're building in a town called Hoover. Which but Bronner right argues Birmingham. the president's proposal guts Social Security's cash flow and adds individual investments are far different than what he does. So you're saying institutional investing is one thing, personal investing is quite another. Absolutely. Big difference. Republicans discovered those same concerns in recent polling, and we found them at Montgomery's Farmer's Market Cafe. Older Americans, like Carolyn Houghton, who voted for Bush, worry their children and grandchildren won't invest wisely. I don't think the, the public in general is going to have the expertise. The level of skepticism about the president's proposal in Alabama would seem remarkable. After all, he walked away with 63% of the vote here in November. So his visit is more than just a pep rally. He needs to convince even people who supported him that his plan is the right plan. In this state, where one in five people draw Social Security, there's almost universal agreement it needs some kind of fix. And many voters are willing to put their faith in the president. Are you in favor of the idea? Are you against the idea? If, if W wants it done, I'm sure it's correct. But among the people President Bush must rely on to get his plan through, faith is not that, enough. I'm not convinced of any plan. I'm not convinced of the president's plan or any of the other uh, plans. President Bush is doing all he can to give political cover to skeptical Republicans, but until he gives them something more to chew on than just talk about private accounts, they say they'll continue to remain on the fence. Bob? You know, John, all weekend the Democrats were saying if the president would just take this idea of personal savings account off the table, they'd be willing to sit down with him and talk about all this. Do you think there's any chance he would do that? I don't think that the president's uh, about to do that. One of his chief economic advisors said that private accounts are on the table and will stay on the table, Bob. Okay. Thank you very much, John. A uh, South American country, by the way, already has a version of what President Bush wants for Social Security, those personal retirement accounts. And later in this broadcast, we're going to show you how it's all working down there. Right now, we want to tell you about uh, former President Clinton's surgery at a hospital here in New York today. Uh, doctors repaired a complication from his recent heart bypass operation. They say they expect him to be well enough to get out of his hospital bed tomorrow and walk. We have the details tonight from CBS News medical correspondent, Elizabeth Callot. 
The former president arrived at the hospital before dawn. His surgery lasted about four hours, and doctors say it was a success. He is awake. He is resting comfortably. After heart bypass surgery in September, Mr. Clinton developed an unusually serious buildup of fluid and scar tissue, blocking 25% of his lower left lung. Dr. Jeffrey Gold, a heart and lung surgeon, explains why it caused him discomfort and what surgeons did to fix it. What is the plan in order to get the scar tissue out? Well, the intention is to just use the scope place it gently between the ribs and take a good careful look at the thickness and location of the scar tissue. They would then pass through a similar port, a small grasping instrument, directly through, try to carefully identify the scar tissue and slowly remove it piece by piece. Okay, so they were initially hoping to remove it just with this one instrument. Found out the scar tissue was too thick and had to go to plan B. What was that? Plan B uh, was to make a small incision on the side of his chest, possibly slightly under his left shoulder blade, and then open it uh, perhaps about an inch or an inch and a quarter between the ribs and directly look at, visualize the lower part of the lung, the abnormal area, and then carefully tease out that abnormal tissue, remove all the scar tissue, allowing his normal lung to re-expand. Mr. Clinton's biggest problem is expected to be pain in his ribs from having them spread apart. But other than that, he'll make a full recovery. Just yesterday, he was playing golf in a driving Florida rain. Doctors say it won't be long, maybe four to six weeks, before he's back on the links again. Elizabeth Caledon, CBS News, New York. In Iraq today, political leaders reached a compromise that should allow formation of a new government there when the National Assembly opens next week. But the violence goes on. The worst attack today, a suicide bombing at a Shiite Muslim mosque in the northern city of Mosul. It happened during a funeral. About 50 people were killed, more than 100 injured. The most severely hurt were taken to a U.S. military hospital. Also today in Baghdad, gunmen ambushed and killed Two police chiefs, no arrest yet. And today, a group representing Muslims in Spain issued a formal Islamic edict denouncing Osama bin Laden. It's the first such action by Muslims anywhere in the world. The fatwa, as it's called, condemns bin Laden for terrorist acts like last year's train bombings in Madrid. And it urges Muslims everywhere to condemn him as well. Coming up next on the CBS Evening News, do those private Social Security accounts work? We'll take you to a country that's had them 25 years. You'll get the inside story. But first, CBS News honors fallen heroes, Roger Turner. He was studying to be an actor, then decided to join the military. He was a good artist and loved to sketch. But more than anything, he loved being with his family and was looking forward to seeing his daughter start kindergarten. Killed in a mortar attack, a photograph of his wife and kids was found inside his helmet. Americans are going deeper into debt. The government today said that household debt rose 11% last year, and for anyone thinking of declaring bankruptcy to avoid paying their debts, the Senate voted today to make that harder. The House is expected to do the same. The cost of borrowing money to buy a house keeps rising. Mortgage rates have hit a seven-month high. Stocks closed mixed today. The Dow gained 45 points. The Nasdaq lost a point and a half. As you know, President Bush's plan for overhauling Social Security would allow workers to invest some of their payroll taxes in the stock market. The South American nation of Chile already has a similar plan. Our CBS News correspondent Trish Regan went down there to find out how it's working. She has the inside story. Here in the heart of the Andes Mountains is an example of a fully privatized social security system. 48-year-old Hector Espinosa is one of the 3.6 million Chileans with a private retirement account. And what is the biggest benefit of it? I have the chance to control my retirement. In 1980, Chile's traditional pay-as-you-go social security system was about to go under. In response, the government created a program that required workers to save for their own retirement through private investment accounts. Ten percent of every paycheck must now be deposited into an individual account, an AFP as it's known in Spanish. Workers have to pay an additional percentage of their wages to cover administrative costs, health and disability insurance. 
the money in the account grows tax-free until the worker retires. With annual returns topping 10% since the program began, advocates of privatization deem Chile a success story. Nearly $60 billion worth of retirement assets have been put to work right here in the Chilean stock market. Supporters of the private account say all this investment in local companies has helped fuel an unprecedented economic boom. I have this map where... Chile's former Labor Secretary, Jose Piñera, designed the program. I believe it gives people ownership, freedom, choice. I believe it's such an American system. But critics say it's a system with serious flaws. Many of Chile's poorest workers, like this tomato farmer, told us they can't afford to put away 10% of their pay. Nearly half of Chile's workforce is self-employed. Many are seasonal workers who rarely declare income, pay taxes, or contribute to their pensions. These people have little to retire on other than the government's guaranteed payment of $150 a month. Still, most people who consistently contribute to their accounts, like Hector Espinosa, say the system works. I hope to put more money in the system in order to obtain a better pension. But that pension depends on the Chilean market sustaining their impressive returns. Still, Hector says the risk is worth it. Because for him and millions of Chileans like him, ownership of a retirement account means ownership of their future. For Shregan, CBS News, Santiago, Chile. And you're watching the CBS Evening News. Still ahead, some fireworks at the Michael Jackson trial. The judge threatened to throw Jackson in jail. At the trial of Michael Jackson today, the jury heard his teenage accuser testify that Jackson molested him twice after they drank alcohol. And the day started with the judge becoming furious at Jackson. Vince Gonzalez is in Santa Maria, California tonight and has the story. Another high-speed SUV race down a California freeway. It must mean a celebrity court case has taken a twist. This is Michael Jackson's motorcade rushing to the courthouse after the judge in the singer's molestation trial threatened to throw the king of pop in jail. That's because Jackson was a no-show at court. Lead defense attorney Tom Mesereau told the judge Jackson was at this hospital with a severe back problem. The judge didn't buy it and gave Jackson an hour to get to court. And this judge is uh, angry. Jackson missed the judge's deadline by a few minutes. The usually well-dressed singer shuffled in wearing what appeared to be pajama bottoms and a t-shirt. His trial resumed almost immediately. Jury selection was delayed last month when the singer checked into another hospital with the flu. Not unusual, says CBS consultant and Jackson biographer J. Randy Terraborelli. You were not surprised by what happened today. Well, people in Michael Jackson's circle are not surprised by what happened today. Uh, you know, people who know Michael know that he does not handle stress well, that he is prone to panic attacks. Jackson's medical problem came the day his young accuser returned to the stand to discuss the alleged molestation. But it might not just be the trial stressing Jackson out. CBS News has learned he also has a new financial crisis on his hands. Apparently, staff at his Neverland Ranch staged a sick out because they haven't been paid in weeks. Animals in the Singer Zoo may have to be moved. His lawyers have reportedly not been paid in months. Our information is that Michael was up all night long last night dealing with his troubles at Neverland. They only need $150,000 to straighten out this mess at Neverland. But the singer may be having trouble raising the money. In the courtroom, the young accuser spoke of Jackson touching him inappropriately. But all that was overshadowed by what happened outside the courthouse. Vince Gonzalez, CBS News, Santa Maria, California. And for those of you who like to keep track of this sort of thing, Forbes magazine is out with its list of the top 20 billionaires. Some familiar names at the top. Bill Gates of Microsoft, number one. He's worth $46.5 billion. At number two, Berkshire Hathaway's Warren Buffett with, give or take, $44 billion. We'll be back with the final word in just a minute. Finally tonight, as we begin this new chapter at CBS News, only a very few people have held this job, among them Walter Cronkite, who was my hero when I was a young reporter, and Dan Rather, my friend for 40 years. It's an honor to be asked to follow them. Dan will be remembered for the remarkable body of work he's compiled over four decades, 
but I'll remember him for his love of the news and the fierce determination and courage to go wherever the news was breaking. I wish him the very best. This is a daunting assignment, but I accept it because we have a proud tradition here and a terrific news team. My friend, the great Watergate reporter Bob Woodward, was asked the other day what his mindset was when he and his partner Carl Bernstein embarked on covering that important story. Woodward said, we didn't have an agenda and we didn't know how it would end. We were just trying to find out what happened. That's what we'll try to do. Find out what happened and tell you about it in clear and concise language. If we do that and do it well, you'll take it from there. I'm not exactly a new face. Many of you have known and trusted me over the years. I take that as a high compliment, and I promise you this, I'll never take that trust for granted. That's the news. I'm Bob Schieffer. See you here tomorrow night. For news 24 hours a day, click on cbsnews.com. Brought to you in part by Walmart. Working together with local suppliers to bring your community local goods, job opportunities, and low prices.